this is like one of those talk that, talks that are in one way very scary and in one way absolutely wonderful. So I'm going to try to somehow give you a rundown on why my research topic is of any interest to anyone else uh, while not getting bogged down with details. Um, if there is anyone expecting a lot of maths, there's not going to be that much maths here because I'm the horrible AI guy and we just cheat when it comes to maths all the time. But before we begin, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about something that's coming up in the future. And uh, that is JuliaCon. So we've been having JuliaCon now since, let's see, 2014. And uh, the, that will be the third JuliaCon, no, the fourth JuliaCon actually coming up. Yeah, it is the fourth JuliaCon. Chicago's proper. Um, pardon? <laughs> sure, okay, so we have zero indexing now for the for Juliacon, but we have one index language. I think they're going to hang us on Hacker News on that, I mean, you know it. Um, but there's a photo from, uh, I think it's from last year actually, and I'd just like to invite anyone, I mean, new users, old users, to keep an eye open because there's going to be a CFP out maybe in a couple of months. And don't be, don't be afraid of submitting. Um, in general, we tend to have people who are very new to the language. Actually, first time I gave a presentation at JuliaCon, I'd used the language, I think, for a month. Um, so, but we also have very experienced people, such as, for example, Tim Holy, who was actually ahead of me for the first JuliaCon, and, well, yeah, he's been around for quite some time. Um, we have people from industry, we have people from academia, but in general, we have also full talks and we have lightning talks, but the most important part, really, is that how do you use Julia? That's what JuliaCon is really about. It's about the community coming together. And please share your experience and tell us how Julia has helped you uh, or not helped you, what we can improve, how we can help, and join us for JuliaCon next year. So, my research field is natural language processing. Uh, I usually ironically say that I sit behind a desk Stare, staring, at, staring at a computer and some of arguing that I'm studying language. And, but we're really, we're a subfield of artificial, of artificial intelligence. Now, when you think artificial intelligence, at least nowadays, you probably think of some amazing things. I mean, you, you can think of things like, <laughs> like these, sca these scary robots that are going to come and kill us, at least if you listen to certain people. Or you might think about these amazing things that, say, for example, AlphaGo, uh, which, uh, if you haven't seen actually the matches, I highly recommend to go, in, go and see it online. It's amazing how that computer can actually beat a human being. Um, so you might actually think that I might be out of a job fairly soon, considering, considering the pace AI is currently traveling at. Well, I would argue a little bit on the contrary. So I would say artificial intelligence, well, maybe. Because even though we're making great advances, we still have large unknown frontiers. That's the reason why I don't get scared of these Terminator robots, because ultimately uh, they're not intelligent enough in order to get out of the building. So, <laughs> for example, I mean, you might, from, just from this year, for example, you might have seen Tay, uh, which was Microsoft's little chatbot that turned into a, let's see, I think, I think this is a quote to remember, by the way, that Microsoft has apologized for creating an artificially intelligent chatbot that quickly turned into a Holocaust-denying racist. <laughs> now, that is an unusual combination of words that I did not expect to see this year, but apparently it happened. So, AIs in general lack common sense. We're very good at, when, it comes to statistic, when it comes to modeling things statistically, we're very bad at things like common sense. Similarly, earlier this year, and this is probably one of my favorites, which was when, uh, <laughs> yes, Google accidentally translated Russia to Mordor, and uh, if you read the, su the subnote, and then you also see that the, the surname on Russia's foreign minister was also translated as sad little horse. <laughs> so, we, we have, I think that my job is safe in one way, but then again, I don't think that my tenure track job talk, maybe I shouldn't use this slide. <laughs> so, what is NLP? So, I don't generally deal with games, I deal with language. And, well, NLP really is a, is a sub-part of artificial intelligence. And we're interested in somehow making computers understand language. <laughs> and this might initially sound trivial, um, and this is also what people believed, in, believed at first in the field, which I will talk about shortly, but it turns out to be quite a bit more complicated than one might actually believe. So the goal for us is what we generally refer to as language understanding. 
Now, nobody really mentions this in a paper because this is something like saying true AI. It's something that we know that we're so far away from that we shouldn't even really bother talking about it. Um, I think it's fairly accepted at this point that language is AI complete, which means that we pretty much need to be able to simulate the intellect of a human being in order to somehow make sense of it all. But we can get pretty far anyway. We can do some cool stuff. So why should we bother really about NLP? Well, there are, I think, pragmatic reasons and there are personal reasons. And I think that NLP is interesting because language is very much the essence of how we communicate. Like, the way we encode knowledge and the way we transfer knowledge between minds really is using language. So I usually argue that language is an API. It is an API between our minds. And thus I find it interesting and a point of study because ultimately I believe that if an AI should communicate with us, probably it should use our API rather than us using their API. I'm not particularly good at speaking binary. And it's also our knowledge stores format. So whenever we want to record something, whenever we want to explain something that we want to pass on to future generations, we write it down. And thus our words become immortal. They can last for thousands of years. And maybe can, can an AI tap into this? Maybe an AI can learn about us by reading an enormous amount of information. Or maybe it can read a lot of information that we don't have enough time to read. Those are some motivations that I have. But it's also difficult, because I would argue that no research topic is really that good unless it's really difficult. And language is dreadfully difficult. And all of the difficulty, I, would, I think, comes from what I call the low bandwidth assumption. And that is that when I say something, it's all pretty much always underspecified. I make assumptions. And why do I make assumptions? Well, I can't give you a formal specification of what I mean. When I say tree, I assume that you guys understand what a tree is. I don't say, do you see that tree over there? And by tree, I mean that thing which is growing out of the ground and has this green. I assume that you know this. But unfortunately, this is not necessarily encoded. So if an AI is going to understand it, they need to somehow grasp that. So also, why is NLP relevant at this specific point in time? Well, don't take my word for it. So this actually comes from some interesting essay. I believe we're in the midst of a big shift in natural language processing, especially as it regards semantics. Put another way, we're moving toward natural language understanding. Oh, he's using the dangerous word there. Um, now, who could this be? Could this be could this some raving lunatic in the NLP community? And it turns out now it's Joshua Benjo who actually used to do computer vision. But now he considers language to be the next barrier. And similarly, if we ask and other guys, a lot of people are working what's called recurrent neural nets to process the sequential signals, like speech, audio, video, and language. There are preliminary results that are pretty good. The next frontier for deep learning is natural language understanding. Again, that dangerous word. And this also, again, comes from a computer vision guy. So it seems that the machine learning community and the AI community is gravitating a little bit towards NLP right now. And I think there's good reason for it. We're making a cool progress. So, we have a little bit of a rich history as well, and a long history. NLP actually dates back to at least the 1930s. And this is before digital computers. And back in those days, you have these wonderful machines, these kind of punched card, this kind of punk, punched card machines. So you could essentially encode information on punched cards. And what they could do it back then was that they could do automatic translation. And what they did is that they did this thing called word by word translation. So it looked at no context. And you punched in, in each and every single card, you would punch in a specific word, and then you would put them in, and then it would go like, and it would automatically translate from one language to another. So it could go something like, I ate sashimi, I, I like Japanese food, yesterday. And then it goes something like, watashi tabemashita sashimi kino. So that, uh, th this is not particularly good Japanese here, but you can kind of get the point across. So this was early stuff in like the 1930s. Things that came later on was in the 40s and 50s when we started getting, together with computer science, we started getting, well, real computers for once. And very early on in AI, language was at the core of it. I mean, I think most people are familiar with, say, for example, the Turing test. And essentially using language in order to evaluate whether or not something is an AI or whether or not something is, is some sort of fake, uh, well, not fake, a fake AI, I mean, a, a real human being. Uh, during the 60s and 70s, uh, we got, like, this is, uh, I think this is actually one of the list machines. So we had expert systems. So people start essentially coding and they would make rules. So they would say something like, if this word is followed by that word, do this. If it's followed by this, do that. And some advances of that time, that era included things like ELISA, which 
maybe you've seen like the Emacs Doctor. I think most people are forced to talk to that thing. Uh, and the Emacs Doctor is something like, I am the psychotherapist, please describe your problem. I'm unhappy. Are you unhappy often? Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Too much work. Why do you say too much work? I'm working a lot. Earlier you said you felt that. Okay. So <coughs> it turns out, in some convoluted way, you can kind of beat the Turing test using this. But ultimately, this AI is just feeding essentially whatever you're saying back to it. So it's not really the kind of AI that we would like to interact with. But still, it was fun for its time. Uh, so, yes. And I would appreciate if you if you would continue. So here, the, here essentially, the AI randomly spouts something, and he's like, I'm lost. I don't even know what to, to answer to that. So <laughs> you give me some more input, right? <laughs> Help me out here, buddy. So during the 80s, 90s, and also the 2000s, we had what was called the statistical revolution. And that is pretty much the wave that we're still riding on today. And that is the idea that I don't code. Well, you do code, but uh, you, don't, you don't code the intricacies of the, of the algorithm. Rather, you just provide a lot of data, and then you have a generic machine learning algorithm that somehow has tried to pick up pattern from the data. This is the reason, for example, why we got the Mordor earlier. So most likely something was wrong in the data, and the algorithm made something that it thought was statistically likely, but it turns out to be completely and utterly wrong. But <coughs> we also had the rise of these kinds of systems, which are called pipelining systems, where you essentially have one statistical model feeding into another statistical model feeding into another statistical model. Uh, this, I believe, is actually the, uh, yes, this is the IBM Watson uh, that played for, uh, played the Jeopardy challenge. And the problem here is that if you make an error, like if you make an error over here, well, then that error is just going to flow through and you have no idea how to correct it. So your system pretty much get, can get trapped in its own errors. So now in the 2010s, I think that's what we say, we have started using a kind of different kind of system, which we call end-to-end -end systems or deep systems, if you prefer. Uh, for example, this is from my naming a child talk from Julia Kahn last year. And what you do pretty much is that you encode things with uh, these latent representations and you compose them. So you're using essentially just ordinary linear algebra, linear algebra operations and you transform, transform vectors into new vectors, into new vectors, into new vectors, into new vectors. Uh, you make predictions and whenever you make an error, now since the, the, you can essentially take the derivative and you can push the derivative all the way from over here through the whole model back to, back to the front which means that you can essentially have the model then learn how to correct for its own mistakes, which is fun. And it's not perfect, but uh, these models also have drawbacks. So today, I would argue at least that NLP is actually practical. If you would have talked to me like 20 years ago, probably not, probably not so much. But certainly today, NLP is a part of our day-to-day -day lives. I mean, we have things like Google Translate, which most of the time gets it right. And we have things like Siri and like IBM Watson, which I think actually they want, want the AI to be a doctor at this point, like a medical doctor. It scares me a little bit, but uh, fun? Dr. Watson. Yes, Dr. Watson, indeed. I, I don't under, I'm not sure if there's actually an, an irony in there or not, but, but still, if you look back, we would have expected, like just like we expect to have flying cars, we expected to have like talking robot cats and HAL from 2001 A Space Odyssey. How come that we don't really have that yet? How come we get Mordor? Well, why is language difficult? Well, everything depends on context. And there's local context, there's social context, there's historical context, and if you don't understand all of these things, language becomes difficult. And we mess up. So it's effectively AI complete. Yes? When you said three, I thought you meant a graph. <laughs> yes. For example, I mean, that is, uh, that is what, it could be, what it's called being institutionalized. Uh, I, have, uh, I, 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 I very much do the same very frequently, and I look silly in front of my, in front of my family. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. So, what does the future hold? Well, I think that we're going to continue for a while with these end-to-end -end models, but they have enormous issues. But I believe that we're no longer really going to have, like, fundamental tasks. We're going to start talking more about how do we test these things to behave like humans? Previously, we would mostly test and like, try to make it conform in linguistic theories. Now I think we're going to make it conform in human behavior. Um, and also, I think we're not then in an age of tasks. So we're going to start defining new cool tasks. But that's just a hypothesis of mine. So. All right. Well, right. so after wasting about 10 minutes not talking about Julia, let's get into Julia. 
So why do I think that Julia is excited for natural language processing or research in general? Well, back in 2014, um, let, let's check the room, actually. How, how many people here use Python? Uh, MATLAB? Oh, yeah, yeah me too. Okay. Uh, MATLAB? Yeah. So I, I was in this situation. I, I had just been on, uh, on a research visit, and I had wasted quite a lot of time in the Python C API or the, or, and the NumPy C API in order to make a specific operation run very, very quick because it was very heavy. And the heavier the operation is, generally the more interesting it is for me as a researcher. So I want performance. And I couldn't get Python to perform. So I looked around a little bit and uh, I was wondering what kind of languages are convenient to implement. So I decided on a simple model, which is just a recurrent neural network. And I wanted to implement it in a bunch of different languages because I didn't just want to guess that Rust was the correct choice or C was the correct choice or whatever. I wanted to actually feel it. So I implemented it in a bunch of languages that I knew I could consider. So I implemented it in C. I implemented it in C with OpenBlast hooks. I implemented it in this MATLAB thing that some of my colleagues were using. I implemented it in Octave because sometimes you don't want to pay. And uh, I also implemented it in Python, NumPy, and OpenBlast. And at this point, I was a real Pythonista. I had used Python, I think, for like seven years. Uh, and then there was this weird other contender there that I had heard, I think, on Hacking News like six months earlier called Julia. It's still really immature, but I, I just threw it in there anyway for good measure because, I mean, heck, it looked pretty nice. So... I use C as my baseline, so this is the number, the number of seconds it took to run one million iterations. And then if you use the OpenBlast, it gets a little bit quicker. And here's Hello Python. Um, <coughs> and there's the three factors with Python, despite actually pushing most into C and Fortran. And then MATLAB, yeah, respectable. And then all, yeah, here's the reason you pay for your license. <laughs> and uh, then also I threw in Julia, but Julia, I couldn't get Julia to perform better than MATLAB. So I, I gave up and went back to Python for a whole month. And then on Hacking News, there was some story. I can't remember what the story was about, but it was about something like, Julia is awesome. And I made a comment in there, and I said, yeah, Julia, Julia is really cool. I really want to like Julia, but I can't make it perform better than MATLAB, so I can't justify using it. And then within 15 minutes, I had a patch to one of my op open repositories uh, by one of the Julia contributors saying that, hey, add these couple of characters here and turn off bound checking. And all of a sudden, it runs a lot better. So this is old stuff, by the way. This is uh, like back into, uh, this is Julia 0.3. So it doesn't, probably doesn't apply to you. But then all of a sudden, this little blasted little language that looks pretty much like Python is almost as fast as C. And that was the moment I was on board. This is the moment when I was absolutely sold that I believed that this is where I want to be. This is the community I want to, I want to be a part in. So that's performance really bad. So over the last couple of months, I've been forced back into, into Python. But occasionally, it really hurts. I mean, I think performance usually doesn't matter until it really, really, really matters. So I had this nasty little experiment I was running. So I had uh, a case study here. So I was doing graph analysis. And I have this tiny little graph with uh, about a million vertices um, and about yeah, something like three billion edges. And uh, I threw this into Python and I was like, okay, sure you have some bindings down into C, so surely I can still do some analysis on this. And uh, I measured the runtime and I measured the memory. So for Python, uh, the runtime was infinite. Um, <laughs> <coughs> and I'm not even and on this machine it was infinite. I mean, not everyone can assume infinite memory uh, because it shoot through something more than the 256 gigabytes of memory that I had on my that I had on my server box. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't allowed to swap, so actually something killed the process. Um, so I got a bit cranky over this, and instead of just walking over to my boss and complaining, I thought like, oh, well, I better get some evidence for this that actually Julia is a better idea. So I implemented something in Julia, like some specialist code on my own. And all of a sudden, it was done in like an hour and used less than 64 gigabytes of memory. Now, you might say immediately that, well, surely you made some really, really, really uh, creepy optimizations and you probably spent like hours and hours on your Julia implementations. So you're probably biased. Well, uh, no. Um, <laughs> this is the full, the full implementation of the graph construction in, I think it's 10 lines of code. And uh, one of the key points here to note is that I can actually just 
do the, do the type alias and I can use int 32s as opposed to use int 64s and this really matters <laughs> in this specific case. As I said, um, performance doesn't matter until it matters and then it, yeah, really matters. Uh, there's also a little bit of a cheating thing here. There's this insert node up which I stole from uh, Stefan Karpinski. Uh, but uh, I don't really count it as my code. I just copy pasted that from a Stack Overflow question. So these are things that really matters to me because I want to scale my experiments. I want to read more text. I want to run larger scale experiments. And sometimes the language is actually a barrier for me. <laughs> so that's why I'm still, well, believing in Julia. So some of the like, key benefits for Julia for people like me is that we can do really easy, fast prototyping. And the more papers I can push out, the better. So I really care about being efficient. Similarly, performance is important for me because say for example that an experiment runs 10 times faster. Okay, that means that what previously took a week now takes a day. It means that what previously would have, been, would, have, would have taken a day is now done over lunch. So this thing really matters to me. More results. And yeah, I want to care about performance when necessary, not always, and Julia is a great choice for that. And we need to have like excellent linear algebra support since pretty much everything machine learning is for linear algebra these days. So, but we have some drawbacks as well, like there's a string overhaul, and I was told that this actually, I shouldn't complain about this, we have a string overhaul coming along in 0.5, so that is really, really great, I've been mean, looking forward to that. Um, I would like to see better la natural language tooling, but that's kind of my fault, because I haven't implemented as much as I should. And also, we kind of need to decide on some sort of deep learning library, because we can't really compete with uh, things like the likes of TensorFlow, but there is movement going on. There's Really cool stuff. I don't know if Flux, uh, is Flux is public yet, but it looks pretty cool. And we have bindings to several like deep learning libraries. So that's pretty nice. But to get a little bit more concrete today, so I, I would like to give like a small taste of what natural language processing and the kind of problems that we deal with, and also how you would work with them a little bit in Julia. So. If you've been staying up to date with machine, le with machine learning in general, you might have seen this thing called word to vec recently. And that is really about the task of representing words. How do we represent the words to the computer so the computer can make sense of words? How do we explain words to a computer? And that's what I want to talk to you about for, I think, the next 15 minutes or so. So why should we bother talking about representations? I mean, isn't that some sort of academic nonsense that only philosophers care about? Well, not really. Uh, in machine learning in particular, the features for any algorithm, essentially what the algorithm makes its decisions based on, are the representations. So, if you have better representations, you tend to have better performance, which means better translation, which means, well, hopefully, like, better information extraction, better searches, all of this kind of stuff, right? And also, representation learning is really at the core of this deep learning thing, which is so incredibly hyped right now. And the understanding that will help. So yeah, it's trendy. Probably won't be in a while, but it's now. So what do we want out of a good representation, like on a high level? So if I wanted to represent a word in some way, how would I represent it? Well, I'd like it to be distinct, because if like monkey and table are represented exactly the same way, we can't tell them apart. So ideally, we want words to be distinct. But also, we want similar words to have similar representations. Because otherwise, they can't generalize. Then it means, for example, that whatever I'm learning about dogs won't apply to cats. So if they're, too dis if they're too distinct, it doesn't work either. So we need to find some sort of middle ground. And how do we do that? Well, we can look at it in a formal way. So here comes a little bit of math, but don't worry. So we can think that we have some words W. And we have a vocabulary. And that's just a set of all our words. That's the only thing it really is. And our task now is to find some representation function. And that looks very mathematic, but really what it looks like is something like, well, we want to have a function f that takes a word, and then there'll be dragons inside, and it should return some sort of sensible representation of that word. So the way that we used to do this in natural language processing, and this is going to sound, probably going to sound very naive to you guys, but this is actually the way that things were when I started back in 2011. And these are what we call sparse binary representations. And what does this mean? Well, what it means is really that we map words to unique positive non-zero integers. All right. So essentially, we have a dictionary which maps a string into an integer, and then we just walk over each and every single word in the vocabulary, and we assign a unique integer to each and every single one of them. Now, each and every single word has some uniqueness to it, right? 
And then what we do is that we create these one, what we call one hot vectors, which is just that we create a vector, which is the same length for your vocabulary. Now, if you want to have like some idea how large a vocabulary can be, we can talk like we can talk about millions. So it's a pretty big vector with a single index position, which is a one, and everything else is zero. All right. So essentially, we're mapping now into into into. The, the, why did I write real value? Okay, yeah, that's a little bit wrong. Sorry, that's not correct. So, how this looks like? Okay, so let's say that we have a very very simple vocabulary. I want to. I'm going to use this as a running example. So say that we have, we only know three words in the whole world, and that's apple, orange, and rabbit. Now two of them are alike, the other one is not. And we just assign essentially an integer to each and every single one of them using our little dictionary. And then we can create these vectors. So now we have these unique one-hot vectors over there. All right? Now we have distinct representations, right? So that's great. We have distinct representations, and so we can think of them as essentially being points in a three-dimensional space. This is the reason why we have a vocabulary of three, by the way, because at least I can't really think about dimensions which are higher than four. Uh, my head starts hurting. So <clears throat> we need to somehow now define what the similarity is between two words. And the standard way of doing that is the cosine similarity. And the cosine similarity is essentially defined as a dot product between two vectors divided by the norm of both multiplied, multiplied by each other. Implementing that in Julia is really nice. It's like one of those reasons why it's nice to have good linear algorithm support. And you're essentially mapping everything into a range of minus, uh, minus one to one, where one means that you essentially have two vectors and they're pointing in the same direction, and they are identical. Well, apart from not with respect to magnitude, but we'll get to that. And we have the other one, which means that they're pointing in opposite directions, and then we have zero, which means that they're orthogonal. And that's it. This is going to be our measure of similarity. So if two words are similar, we want the value to be close to zero. If they're dissimilar, we want the value to be closer to minus one. All right. So, all right. We have our representations. We have our old school representations from 2011, 2010. Now we're going to crack open our cosine similarity right here. Okay. So it turns out that uh, the similarity between apple and rabbit is zero. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. All right. That's cool. And apple, no, wait. Apple and orange is also zero. And orange and rabbit. Okay. So everything is zero. So we have now succeeded in accomplishing our first task, which is to make everything distinct. However, we have no similarity at all, which means that whatever you learn about apples won't apply to oranges. And that's bad. How do we solve this? All right, second step. Let's try what we call dense continuous representations instead. All right, so we continue using exactly the same idea that we used previously. We map each and every single word just to a unique integer. And then what we do is that we call, what we do is that we create embedding. So we embed the words as matrix rows, all right? Or columns, actually, in Julia, but yeah. Um, and what we can simply do then is that we create a, we can create a matrix, which is of the same, the same size of your vocabulary and then some magic value D that you just have to set according to, well, either guess it or do a little bit of cross-validation. And <coughs> then we can simply return a row in that matrix. All right. So now we're going to be mapping into d-dimensional dim e-value vectors. And it can look like this. We have the same vocabulary as previously. And we have the same ideas as previously. And we create this uh, magical little vector. So this is constructed for the sake of an example. We'll talk shortly about how you learn this stuff. And <coughs> then we can just return a specific, col a specific, col uh, specific row right there. And now we see that we get these two-dimensional vectors. And uh, if we plot them, they look kind of like this. Does it make any sense? I don't know. It's machine learning. We don't need to care about such things. Um, <laughs> we're empiricists. And uh, <coughs> if we now bring out our cosine similarity, let's see if the situation have improved a little bit. Oh, well, OK. Apple and rabbit are somewhat similar. OK, we can, we can all get them both alive. So maybe, maybe it's OK. And uh, apple and orange is really similar. Okay, that looks cool. And uh, orange and rabbit is also some similarity. But at least, at least apple and orange are reasonably similar right now. So that's pretty cool. But this was not really like a um, a real situation. Now we want to actually we would like to learn representations. And how do we do this? Well, we need to take a little bit of inspiration from some old linguists. And I don't, I don't think they had beards though. So back in 1954. And uh, there was this guy called Sally Harris, and he said that Oculus and Eye Doctor occur in almost the same environments. If A and B have almost identical environments, we say that they are synonyms. Okay, 
There's some, tr there's some truth to that. If you use the word in similar ways, I mean, it's almost Wittgensteinian, this. And <coughs> similarly, if a little bit more simply put, or maybe a little bit more beautifully put, John Robert Firth, which I think was actually at UCL, said that you should know a word by the company it keeps. Okay, can we somehow formalize this? It turns out that linguists have been using this kind of analysis for quite a long time. And they refer to this as co-occurrences. And <coughs> what you do is that you take a huge amount of text. Say, for example, the whole of Wikipedia. And then you look at each and every single instance where Apple is mentioned. And then you look to the left, and then you look to the right, and you see what friends does Apple have. So you can say comparing an apple to an orange. You can say things like apple orange, an apple and orange from Florida. And then, of course, you always get noise, because this is real data. But ultimately, you're hoping that statistically this noise is small, so that just by increasing the data side, it will be weeded out. All right? What we then do is that we can just reuse our IDs like we did before, and we can construct a matrix. And in this little matrix, this will be the number of occurrences of the word. So this is the number of occurrences of the, of the word apple. Here's the number of occurrences of the word orange. And here's the number of occurrences of the word rabbit. And this is the number of times that apple co-occurs co with orange. And of course, it's, a it's symmetric along the diagonal. This little matrix you can do quite a lot of fun with. So we can actually use this as our representations. And this was done for quite some time. So we just dig up our old dictionary again. Then we define a simple function where we just fetch out, fetch out a row of the matrix. And now we're mapping into this <coughs> real valued space. And well, I mean, I, you, get, you get this at this point. Uh, and we can just fetch out vectors. Now we have, have vector representations that are learned. These are essentially coming from data rather than us actually inputting the right values. So if you look at these similarities, they kind of make sense. I mean, this apple and rabbit, OK, not that similar. Apple and orange, more similar. Orange and rabbit, OK. This is because of the noise, right? But ultimately, if you take the whole of Wikipedia, this noise tends to at least go down quite a bit. So that's pretty cool. And there's also a little bit of a trick. You can actually create, so these are very high, dimen these are very high dimensional embeddings. You can actually use matrix factorization <laughs> in order to <coughs> take this huge matrix C and then approximate it using, a, using two smaller matrices. And by doing so, you can actually have these dense, lower dimensional embeddings. And this is what people used to do up until about 2011, 2012, when the deep learning revolution came. And the deep learning revolution said that we don't want to look at the whole data anymore. We want to learn in a different way. Maybe people in here have like, studied like German or some other horrible foreign language which is difficult to learn, like English. Um, and uh, you've probably done stuff like, you've gotten these kinds of exercises, right? You have these slot fillers. And uh, you say something, I had some for breakfast today. And intuitively, when you see this sentence, right, certain words pop up into your head. Like, for example, things that pop up is probably like breakfast cereal, like something like, uh, or oatmeal, or if you're from Scotland, maybe like black pudding. Um, Certain words certainly pop up, right? I mean, good words is like cereals. We can intuitively say, this is a good fit, right? And we can also say that if I say something like, I had some airplanes for breakfast today, you're probably going to say, no, I don't really think that that actually was a good fit, right? So maybe we can exploit this. So we can create an unsupervised loss function. I'm not going to go into all of the maths here. If you want to talk about this later, I'll be very happy to do so. But the idea is pretty much that what we have is that we have these we have context, so we can just look at our data. We can look, look at Wikipedia, and we can just rip out a single word, and then we ask our algorithm to fill in that slot. But this, of course, is trivial, because now we have only positive examples. We need negative examples as well. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out uh, a very simple way of doing it is just to take some other random word and say that that word should not be there. Now, you might object to this, because maybe you're not a machine learner and you actually have principles. Um, and uh, you say that sometimes this might be wrong. And you're right. Sometimes the algorithm is going to randomly fill in black pudding, even though black pudding actually fills in, goes in there. But the thing is, you need to think about it like a casino. And that is that the house only needs to win more than 50% of the time. And as long as you do that, you're going to have a learning signal. So it actually works out in the end. And then 
what we're trying to maximize, we're trying to maximize the probability of uh, the true context observed from the data given some parameters, and this is the matrix we're going to use for representations, and we, want to we of course want to minimize these false fake examples. In reality, this algorithm is a little bit more tricky than this. Um, once again, you can talk to me about that afterwards. The word to vec essentially optimizes this objective, but it has a bunch of hacks on top of it, which makes it work better. And now we get neural representations. So I went online and I downloaded the word to vec representations from, uh, which are distributed by Google, and they ran it on a pretty big data set of like, what is that, one billion words? That's a pretty big matrix, if you're going to be, you, no, wait, one billion times one billion, right? And a vocabulary of, uh, oh, sorry, a vocabulary of it's only three million. And dimensionality of 300. So don't ask me now what does dimension 52 mean. I have no clue what it means. Uh, all I know is that if I take these things and throw them into my model, my model performs better. <coughs> and that's pretty much as much as you get from most machine learners. So you can now look at these. So fortunately, there's a wonderful person in this room that, that has written a, uh, a wrapper around this specific format. So you can just do a package add and then start using the library, and you can actually fetch these things into Julia. And if you look at these dimensions now, so these are 300 dimensional vectors. So I have absolutely no clue what all of these dimensions mean. But they seem OK, I guess, because at least rabbit, rabbit disagrees here with orange and apple. So probably they're OK. And if we look at the similarities of this kind of stuff, it turns out that Apple and Rabbit, 034, Apple Orange, 039, 010. Does this make sense? Well, um, empirically it works. I, I, that's all I can say. And I ho hope at least I've argued that embedding words in a high dimensional space actually makes sense because that allows us to generalize. But really, really cool stuff happens if you take these things and you project them down into two dimensions. So you, then you get these snowballs with dust, with dust in them or dirt in them. But if you zoom in here, you get these really, really interesting patterns arous, arising in the data. So this is unsupervised to learn only from data. There's no human being or anything. That essentially, the only thing the computer has done is like read text for like 12 hours. And what you see is, for example, that you see that these names, for example, tend to be similar. So you see things like Lee, Martin, Thomas, James. And uh, you see things like what? Like you see here over here, you see singular forms of vehicle, plural forms of vehicle. And essentially, the model has somehow, just by looking at text, picked up these kinds of relationships that we find intuitive. And that hopefully makes the, the model perform better. Incidentally, uh, I think there's also sometimes a source of errors, because I have noticed that Google Translate a couple of years ago really liked to translate if I wrote in Swedish, I went to Stockholm, and then translated it to English, it would become, I went to London. Um, <laughs> so it's not always flawless, but it certainly works. But what we, we already knew that you could do this for like 10, 15 years. What really, really made, made uh, like a big splash back in 2011 when these models came around was this. You can do algebra with these things. So you can say things like, what happens if I take king? I remove man, and then I add woman. Which point in this high dimension, 300 dimensional space do I end up close to? And it turns out you end up fairly close to queen. Queen is the closest word. That is pretty nuts. There's no supervision here. It's only look, looking at text. And similarly, if you take something like Paris minus France plus Italy, you end up in Rome. OK. You can also take things like, I think you can take like Japan, like you can take like sushi minus Japan plus England. Uh, this one I don't have here because then you actually end up with pudding. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that, if that is accurate or not, but that's at least what the model is telling me. So this is the kind of cool stuff that we've been able to do. Uh, but this is just scratching the surface. So as a little bit of a summary, I have talked a little bit about that. I think there are exciting times for AI. Like we're not really done yet, but we have some cool stuff that we can do and also a little bit about the long history of NLP. And I've also talked a bit about representing words, which is like the first step, really, in a natural language, process, natural language processing pipeline. We do cool stuff with sentences, too, but do talk to me or read some of my papers, and we could talk about sentences, but there's a whole can of worms that we're not going to open up here. But yeah, it's only the beginning. So yeah, thank you.
Okay, um, you fight it out, I guess. Just out of curiosity, have yep. you tried John's uh, recently released TensorFlow wrapper in Julia yet? Oh uh, yes, I have. How do you feel about it? Um, what are your feelings. Like it's okay. It's it's good, um, but I think we can kind of do better. So, for example, there was a beautiful blog post a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was a month ago now, by this guy who essentially took the the TensorFlow graph and then extract turned it into like LLVM bytecode and then compiled it down to and I was like my god if only there was a language where you would kind of get this for free um, I don't know I, 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 I wish that we could somehow be first citizens in a sense like the TensorFlow graphs are okay but we're always going to be lagging behind and when Google says that I mean I remember when they released TensorFlow right they said like it's cool, guys. It's really easy to write wrappers, but now it turns out that like 90% of TensorFlow's functionality is in Python, <laughs> which we have to interact with as second citizens. I, I think we can do better. I think also that it's an exciting time for like these deep learning methods because the APIs for complex models are still really hairy and really horrible. And there are so many times, and I, can, I can't tell you this enough, there are so many times when my colleagues sit down and they go like, oh my god, I've had to vectorize this whole thing. I mean, you know. I mean, everyone here has been in MATLAB, right? I mean, you have these, you have these files with like ugly vectorization hacks that you have, which are something like, they look like Perl, Perl expressions. And uh, they are rather legible. And you have to do similar things right now in TensorFlow. And you're sitting there and you're going like, how nice it would be if I could do a loop. And then I could compile it down to a GPU code and compile it down to CPU code and then my model would just run instead of me having to essentially write a more inefficient version. And I think we have an edge there. But then we have to write our own approach to it. But yeah, I'm optimistic. Very good answer. Not too long probably, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, just a quick question on the understanding of those dimensionalities. So when you were talking about this Google News uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Google vocabulary? News data. Yes, Google News data. So mm -hmm. when you have this uh, 300 dimensions, it means that, for example, it's a different feature of uh, each word. Something like a length or a, a neighbor or I don't know. You mean want me to interpret those 300 dimensions? Is that what you're saying? No, no, I'm just asking for confirmation. This is the, the correct way to... to, I'm, to I, I, in general, I think the easiest way to think of it are points. Um, there are arguments against this interpretation of how you should represent meaning and semantics, uh, but it's currently some of the best that we have. If points. that answers... Yeah, I, I, I think that, at least for me, projecting it down to two dimensions and then thinking about it saying that I believe that there's a region of things which are alive, I believe there's a region of things which are not alive. Like there might be a dimension in there that somehow expresses nounness, or, uh, or some that expre ex expresses fruitiness, things like that. Ultimately the information, like there was a huge debate actually when these, these things came out, especially from like the more old school guys asking how is this possible that you can actually do this kind of, this kind of algebra and what information is in there, and my response immediately was that, well, it's obvious what's in there. It's co-occurrences, because that's what it learns from, so it has to be co-occurrences. So the intuition, I think it was Chris Quirk from Microsoft Research who essentially said that you can think of it as what you're really doing is that you're taking King and all of the contexts that King has ever occurred in, and then you take all of the contexts of man that has ever occurred, and then you're kind of removing those contexts, and then you're left with something else, and then you're essentially flipping in the, w the women part into that thing, and then that's pretty much what happens. But yeah, to be entirely honest, this is one of the big issues in machine learning right now, in particular with deep learning models. They're incredibly hard to interpret. They're good, there's no question about that, but they're really hard to interpret. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, yes, there are. Uh, there is at least one NLTK wrapper. No, sorry, no. 
point. It's at least one, uh, one kernel peeve wrapper, yes. Um, I actually tried a long time ago to write a better one in using Java call rather than going through the like the, the command line interface to it. Um, I I haven't really kept my eyes open for I, mean, I think there's a fairly exciting package coming out of um, Nara Institute of Technology where he has something with like tokenizations, part of speech tagging and a lot of other stuff that you want to have in your in most NLP pipelines. Um, NLTK wrapper, I, I don't know. It would be fairly easy to do though with uh, with PyCall if someone's up for it. I think it's partially because I am a little bit biased against NLTK, but don't tell the guy I'm sitting next to at work because he's actually one of the one of the authors. Um, I the group that I was in preferred core NLP for whatever reason. Well there's no more questions at the time, I'll see.